This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Our last speaker, and it gives me great sadness to say that we're coming towards the end of the session, is uh, Lawrence Walker. Lawrence Walker, um, before I read his bio, I was going to say he's one of our own, but uh, when I noticed that he's just called us Jaffers, I have to sort of question that. And for the Australians and the um, audience, Jaffa is a, is a Kiwi term, and it's, uh, it's as an, as an Aucklander myself now, I'd say just another friendly Aucklander, but much of the rest of New Zealand would say the F stands for something slightly different. <laughs> but he's from the Windy City. Now, Lawrence is an intensivist at um, our cardiothoracic and vascular intensive care unit in Auckland, so the CVICU, and they are our national ECMO um, centre, heart lung transplant centre. So we'd otherwise we'd call them the clever docs. Now, in the, in the theme of being exceptionally clever, Lawrence is going to teach us all about, in as little as nine minutes, about the, the other ventricle. Okay, thanks uh, Rob. Um, I imagine this is what speed dating is like. Um, so like Andy, I think I need to start by humbly putting my hand up and saying that I don't consider myself an expert with right ventricular failure, but I do admit that I, I look after these patients probably on a daily basis. Um, but any gaps in my knowledge I've made up for by asking nearly everyone in my department over the last couple of weeks, so hopefully I'll be able to toe the party line. Um, so the right ventricle has um, had a bit of a bad rap over the last 20 years or so. It's often talked about as the forgotten chamber, the forgotten ventricle, it's the dark side of the moon, it's very mysterious, it's the dumb waiter. Um, and a lot of the, um, a, lot of, a lot of studies, uh, you know, mostly on, on laboratory animals, um, when they manage to um, uh, severely affect the contractility of the right ventricle, they decided that it actually wasn't very important and it was basically a conduit between the venous circulation and the lungs. But, of course, we know that's not the case now. Um, a, lot, a lot of the um, experimental data and clinical data that we do have is based on animal studies, um, and there is a relative dearth of, um, of evidence, um, especially sort of evidence-based medicine, on the therapies that we provide. Um, and a lot of the, the um, a lot of the, uh, the logic behind the way we treat the, the right ventricle is based on understanding of physiology and how the different therapies that we provide affect that physiology, and a lot of it's based on clinical experience as well. Um, and to quote uh, one of the best movies come out of Australia, a lot of what we do is based on the Marbo and the vibe. <laughs> Um, so this will hopefully be familiar to you and make you relax. So the, the cardiac output of the right ventricle is very similar to the left ventricle. It's based on heart rate and preload and contractility and afterload. I guess the thing that's a little bit different about the right ventricle is, is how sensitive it is to afterload, and it's a relatively low-pressure circuit. Um, the normal right ventricle, so its function is to perfuse the lungs, to perfuse the lungs with, um, with venous blood, and it's also um, there to fill the left ventricle. Um, it's got a slightly unusual shape compared to the left ventricle. It's kind of triangular and it wraps around the left ventricle and it contracts in a slightly different way. The left ventricle, you mostly see circumferential um, inward um, contraction and the right ventricle, um, most of its ejection is based on longitudinal contraction and shortening, although you do see some free wall movement as well. Um, as I said, it's a low pressure circuit. The pressure gradient between the pulmonary artery and the left atrium is only about 5 or 10 millimetres of mercury and um, it's very afterload sensitive. So, I mean, I hate to do this, but you have, it's kind of been the theme, I guess, of the conference, but the, the, I guess you could say the left ventricle is the more muscle, muscly ventricle. It's um, thick-walled, it copes well under pressure, whereas the right ventricle is relatively thin-walled, it's quite sensitive, um, and <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really cope that well under pressure. I'm not sure if Quaid's playing tomorrow, unfortunately, but anyway. Um, so really quickly, just looking at an echo, um, it helps my understanding of, of ventricular function. I can see things. So you can see that the lateral side of the ventricle there is moving up towards the apex. That's the tapsy. And you also see some free wall movement. This ventricle is cranking along. It's on the left there. That's the right ventricle. A bit confusing. Um, this is a TOE. So same thing, upside down. You can see the tapsy there, the lateral part of the annulus contracting down towards the apex. So in terms of pathophysiology, I don't want to get too complicated, but... Um, there's a, a variety of pathologies, obviously, which affect the right ventricle, um, and these lead to sort of three um, main scenarios, if you like, um, and they affect either the preload of the ventricle, the contractility, and the afterload. Now, we look um, mostly at, after people after cardiac surgery, and I guess all of these 
areas affected after cardiac surgery. Um, but in a general ICU, you might see problems mostly related to high afterload, people with decompensated pulmonary hypertension, um, bad ARDS, uh, people on lots of mechanical ventilation, and often um, sort of problems related to left heart failure. And also, of course, there's a lot of metabolic disturbances cause problems with um, pulmonary hypertension, especially um, hypoxia and, and hypercarbia and acidosis. Now, depending on the ability of the right ventricle to cope, in general, with these sorts of stresses, it will distend. Um, and this can lead to a spiral of badness, which we need to try and hold. Um, so this is where we bring in the concept of ventricular interdependence. And when the right ventricle dilates, because it's contained within a... a well, it's a, the pericardium does have the ability to stretch a little bit, but not a lot. And um, with significant dilation, it'll start to compress the left ventricle. And as the right ventricle dilates, it also tethers and pull, pulls down the um, tricuspid valve leaflets, and then you get more dilation. And when the left ventricle starts to get compressed, you get um, reduced diastolic filling, filling, reduced left ventricular sort of output, hypotension, and then less perfusion of the coronary arteries, especially on the right side. So you get this, this, um, this downward spiral, which is really important to try and halt and, and manage. And that's where echo can come in sometimes quite usefully to have a look at the... Um, mechanical sort of balance there. So this is a bad ventricle. This ventricle is dilated. The free wall is not doing much at all. Same with this one. This is a big PE. You still get some longitudinal contraction there, and this is a TOE. So a nice, I mean, bad, a bad dilated um, right ventricle that's not really doing much. And this one's kind of really not doing much at all. It's kind of like a conduit. So in terms of the management, um, most of the management is focused on all the basic supportive cares. So we can do lots of fancy things in ICU. We've got PA catheters, we've got echo, we've got lots of fancy monitors. But um, none of those, and lots of fancy medications as well, but none of them will really, they're all a bit of a waste of time unless we do the basic things well. Um, and then the rest of the management is mostly around the specific therapies, and that's based on what you think the underlying pathology is, and often it will be a combination of things. So in terms of the basics, um, I guess the first most important thing is to treat the underlying conditions. So if you've got a PE, consider, consider thrombolysis, etc. Um, if you've got ischemia, consider having a PCI. Um, but the, 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 ba the, the, sort of the underlying theme of the basic um, principles of management is to support the RV while you're treating the underlying condition. Um, so I think the first take-home message is to intubate the person you'd normally intubate. A lot of conventional wisdom says that you know, if, you, if you've got right ventricular failure, you should be breathing spontaneously and awake. But if you've got someone who's you'd normally intubate, they're hypoxic, they're on CPAP, they're flailing around, um, you should manage them how you'd normally manage them. Manage them. Um, you might need to have a syringe of adrenaline handy after you've intubated them, but, but um, don't be scared to intubate them. Um, once you've intubated them, avoid hypoxia and hypercapnia, or in, in general, avoid hypoxia and hypercapnia. Um, if they're on a ventilator, avoid really high ventilator pressures if possible. Um, of course, you want to provide enough PEEP to recruit the lung, um, but some people prefer a, a, a low tidal volume, high respiratory rate strategy. Um, but again, the important things are to ensure you prevent hypoxia and hypercarbia. Um, like I said in the previous slides, avoid excessive volume overload. A lot of people will be responsive to volume, and it's reasonable to try a little um, fluid boluses. If you have a CVP in and you see the CVP shoot up with another, none, the rest of your hemodynamic parameters staying sort of stable, then it's probably time to stop. A lot of the time, especially in, in my unit, um, volume overload is a problem, and by the time most people get to ICU, volume overload generally is a problem. But um, if you're going to give uh, fluid, give it cautiously and monitor the response. Um, avoid hypotension. Um, the perfusion of the, um, of the right ventricle in terms of coronary perfusion is very dependent on the MAPS. Um, and when it's dilated and uh, uh, increased in, in volume and pressure, the perfusion to the ventricle is impaired. So you need to make sure you rigorously defend your MAPS and manage acidosis early. So um, we'd normally put someone on a bicarb buffer initially because venous congestion can um, you know, impair the metabolism of citrate. So in terms of your vasopressors and inotropes, this is, I mean, this is a talk in itself, and again, a lot of the um, evidence is you know, quite sparse. But I think the key take-home message is if you're hypotensive, you just start with the vasopressor and support the coronary perfusion. What you choose, noradrenaline, 
um, or vasopressin, there's a theoretical benefit that vasopressin um, is relatively sparing on the pulmonary arteries, um, so noradrenaline is a reason, reasonable one to start with. If you're going to use an inotrope, an inodilator makes sense, and, and what you use will depend um, a bit on where you live probably. Um, dobutamine and milrinone are quite common ones. Um, some caution with adrenaline because it will cause a metabolic acidosis and you don't want that, but it's, you know, it's there in your armamentarium if you need it. And there's increasing evidence for, for levosimendin um, if, uh, if you can afford it. But these are probably the mainstay of what we'd use initially in the acute management of right ventricular failure. Um, in terms of the, the pulmonary vasodilators, um, these are probably the main three. Nitric, uh, a lot of people are familiar with this, inhaled ilocrost. I guess the benefit of the inhaled things is they act locally and, um, and you, know, you can turn them off pretty quickly so you can start them and stop them quite quickly. And once um, there's some stability, you can consider other things. Of course, there's no mortality benefit proven with these. This is all about improving hemodynamic parameters. So, um, and, and this is the weird and wacky stuff, you know, the, the really severe um, uh, rescue, mechanical rescue therapies. Um, we often have people who come back from theatre with an open chest or we reopen their chest if they fail on the unit. Um, and there's VA ECMO vans and balloon pumps, which of course are controversial. So in terms of the take-home messages, I think uh, the key take-home messages do all the basic right ventricle supportive care as well. Um, all the fancy stuff is, is, isn't going to help unless you do the, the basic stuff well. Avoid excessive volume overload. Think about that picture of ventricular interdependence. Um, use all the vasoactive agents based on the underlying pathology and um, hopefully ECHO may guide you. If you're doing an ECHO or if you don't do ECHOs yourself, if the ECHO tech's coming up to do your ECHO, watch over their shoulder and have a look and get you a slightly better understanding of what's going on. All good?